Sabine Hoffenfelder is a theoretical physicist in good standing, um, fighting out of Frankfurt, Germany. She has a blog called Back Reaction that I follow. I think it's a nice way to keep up with current research in the field. And she also has this program called Talk to a Scientist. Now, this sets up a dialogue between a real professional physicist or other types of scientists and an amateur. It costs $50 for like 20 minutes. And so far, they haven't found anything kind of worthy of like further uh, investigation, um, but it has given this line of communication between uh, professionals and amateurs that hasn't been there before. Now, I decided to participate in this because I take my own proposal for gravity very seriously and was hoping that maybe this could be the one exception. Isn't that what everybody who participates in Talk to a Scientist says? Well, maybe not. But I thought it was worthy of the 50 bucks and I will kind of recreate the conversation and probably go over 20 minutes because I'm kind of like that. Uh, and so here it is. So I started out by saying, look, I'm a fringe physicist. And just saying that means the odds of me saying truth are incredibly low. I've got a list of some 7,000 uh, folks who think they've made a new contribution uh, and yet that's probably not the case. And of course I own Quaternions.com, so I'm just a Quaternion nut, right? Everything's a Quaternion. So if you combine those two, it's easy to see why a professional just wouldn't really engage their own brain in anything I said. So how do I combat that kind of bigger picture issue? Well, when I said was there's kind of three different research programs that I think all kind of come together in my own efforts to come up with a new explanation of gravity. And the first is, yeah, I am trying to do everything with the quaternions. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, and in fact, that's a long-standing tradition. Uh, certainly started with Hamilton back in 1843, and every generation has had a person or two try and do that sort of thing. Now, in 1908, Minkowski, who was Einstein's math teacher, said, you know, we're going to no longer think of time and space separately from one another. We are always going to have to think of them together. And a lot of people still don't do that. <laughs> one of the nice things about using quaternions is they, they force you to actually think of these together. There isn't like a choice. There's a slot for time, there's a slot for space. And so that's what people should do, and they don't. It's particularly true with how people handle energy, because people with PhD should know it's energy and three momentum together. And Instead, they go, oh, energy, mass, I'll just interchange them, which sounds kind of crazy to me because they don't have the same properties. For example, if you start moving, well, in a nice constant way, well, your mass isn't going to change, but your energy is. Your energy and your momentum are going to change, in such a way that your mass doesn't. And they know that. In matter of fact, you take energy and momentum and square it in the quaternion form, and you end up with mass squared and EP, energy times uh, three momentum. And like nobody works with energy and three momentum, even though if you were in the Minkowski kind of program, you would do that. Now, the final research approach uh, came out of this meeting at the Perimeter Institute in June of 2015. So this is fresh. Uh, it was called Convergence. 
And all these people came together and they said, gee, 1920s was nice. You, you write down some really short equation and it has huge impact. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get back to that? Because <laughs> right now we've got a lot of people who are dealing with 10 or 11 dimensions and they have to take that and they have to compactify it somehow down to four and the math is crazy difficult. Gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had simple stuff? And I think that does show up with my approach to gravity. All right. But how do I establish that I am worthy of some time, serious consideration instead of easy dismissal? And I ha can point to two results. The first involves Maxwell's source equations. Because if you go into the literature, they will say, uh, you can't derive the Maxwell equations unless you use complex valued quaternions or biquaternions. They are no longer a division algebra. And to me, that's an enormous loss because the, the pattern I'm following is the most important numbers are real numbers uh, the, and the complex numbers and the next to come in to that kind of collection is the quaternions. And quaternions actually have real and complex numbers as subgroups. So I thought I've got to figure out how to do that. And in fact, I did. It's really, it wasn't that hard when you know how the Maxwell equations are derived. What you have to do is end up with the magnetic field squared minus the electric field squared and you put that into the Euler-Lagrange machinery and you get uh, Gauss's law and Ampere's law. And what I figured out was that if you take the simplest four derivative of the simplest four potential, then you get in that vector part, you get the electric field and the magnetic field. But it also gets you a gauge field. And so that has to be zero for things that travel at the speed of light. And presumably for things that don't travel at the speed of light, that's got to be not zero. <laughs> so actually, I like uh, this quaternion approach because it says, gee, you're going to have two, two major classes of uh, fields in electromagnetism. Now, if you do it in the reverse way, then the, the magnetic field flips its sign and then you, what you get is not only the b squared minus e squared, but you also get the pointing vector, which of course is known thing in EM. It's just not used very often. But I think it's really fascinating because a deep issue of the standard model being electromagnetism, the weak force and the strong force, is that it doesn't care if time is reversed. And it's like, that's kind of odd. Well, you can see why it's not reversed in this case, because everything's squared that goes into it. So if you reverse time, times a, you get another reverse time, and it looks like time isn't reversed. But that's not the case for the pointing vector. The pointing vector has a factor of time coming in from the E field and none from the B field. So if you flip it, it will flip signs. I haven't been able to build that out at all, but I think this whole gauge issue and the pointing vector caring about time reversal means that the, the quaternion approach is actually kind of preferable, shall I say. <laughs> okay, so another issue I deal with is um, in a new way is real getting a real valued Lorentz boost because the Lorentz group is just absolutely essential to doing uh, relativistic physics. And in the literature, they say you can't get there from here using real value quaternions. And that's just not the case. I mean, I figured it out uh, a couple of years ago. And I think I also figured out why they didn't find it. The reason they didn't find it is because Quaternions are essentially a one-trick pony in the eyes of uh, physicists. 
they do 3D rotations very well. And they do it with a simple triple product. You take a cosine and sine sort of quaternion, and you pre and post multiply another quaternion by that thing, where one of them gets a conjugate operator op, uh, acting on it, and boom, you've got your uh, rotation. So to get into space-time rotations, people tried using a hyperbolic cosine and a hyperbolic sine. And when they did that, they got two terms that were right, uh, two terms that were actually wrong, and two terms that were actually missing. And then they gave up. <laughs> it's like, well, if you got a problem, uh, fix it. And I do that by having these other two terms in here and get exactly the kind of standard uh, answer people expect. So the rotation in three-dimensional space sort of operation is done with a compact Lie group. Who knows exactly what that means? <laughs> but the, the um, Lorentz group is not a compact uh, Lie group. And it might just be that the way to do that algebraically is add these other terms in and everything will work out fine. So I can say at this point that the traditional let's advance quaternions uh, research project, I've advanced it in those two material ways. But my theory really works on modifying how we think about space-time. So how do we think about space-time? Well, we think about it using Riemannian space-time. And I took this um, little graphic from Sean Carroll's uh, lecture notes on general relativity, where you start with a set, you construct a topological space, you get a manifold, and then you have to add a connection which shows how the different neighboring kind of uh, portions of space-time have a relationship to each other and you then introduce a metric and when you do all that you end up with this Riemannian manifold. And I should say that there are a lot of technical choices in there that have all kinds of important consequences on the kind of physics you're studying. Now what I do is the beginning of that. It starts with a set, a topological space, say I've got a quaternion manifold, and then I kind of stop. I stop because what I do really is instead of thinking of R as just X, Y, and Z, and they don't really have a relationship with each other, I make those actually imaginary with an I, a J, and a K, so they necessarily have a algebraic relationship with time. And then I see what sort of things I can investigate from there. So one of the first things I look into is what is a square? Okay, so I'm going to deal with differential elements. And the reason I'm going to use the differential elements is because particularly when you're like thinking about what happens in gravity, you know if you take a step uh, up or down in a gravity field, immediately things are going to change. So that's why we need um, the, the, the delta T and delta R. So I'm thinking about a pair of events closely spaced in time and in, um, in space, and just squaring that up, and I end up with dt squared minus dr squared uh, 2 dt uh, dr setting C, I guess, equal to 1 in this case. And when you look at that, as a professional physicist, <laughs> one of those terms is thoroughly um, familiar. And that would be the first one there, the dt squared minus dr squared. That is the Lorentz invariant interval of special relativity. And one could say that that's the heart of special relativity. And then there are those other three terms. <laughs> and this is where I say, hey, convergence people, you want something simple? Well, t tell me the name of DTDR. And I did ask this fellow, what is its name? 
and he didn't have it. And that's been my experience. Nobody can name this beast. Oh, it's not really that big a beast, is it? So it's got, when you think about it, let's think about R, um, R and R. Okay, let's say, what is R times R? Well, it's an area. It's actually also a way to describe certain types of vectors. Hmm. What is R over R? Well, that's an angle. And angles are used absolutely everywhere. Okay, what is R over T? DR, DT? Oh, that's velocity. <laughs> that's probably in almost every single physics equation out there. Velocity is all over the place. And now, to complete the set, we have to think about what is space times time. What do you mean it's nothing? <laughs> what do you mean nature doesn't use it like ever? That doesn't sound like nature. That sounds like us not thinking through everything. So I generated a name for it. I call it space times time because it's space times time. It's a very descriptive name and I hope people will understand it. So for, in special relativity, you have two inertial observers moving apart from each other at a constant velocity. And if they see these two events, they will say, hey, the Lorentz invariant interval, dt squared minus dr squared, is exactly the same. Cool. Great. But how are the two people moving apart? You can't figure that out from the interval. You can figure it out from the space times time. You can figure it out exactly from that thing. <laughs> so to me, it's already got some value. It tells you what you should be able to figure out right then and there. Okay, so now let's look at the, the dual case. The du dual case would be what happens if the people, these two observers, agree to the space times time, but they disagree about the interval. It's like, well, when do you ever disagree about intervals? I mean, never, ever, never, ever in special relativity, but all the time when you're thinking about gravity. So that could be gravity. And so Graphically, we take the light cone of special relativity that everybody uses. We rotate it a little bit. Oh no, rotating a little bit is meaningless because the whole point of uh, Lorentz group is that the light cone stays the light cone. This is about causality, people. You don't screw with the light cone. <laughs> you can play around with the values that we use, but leave the light cone alone. So what about these hyperboles? These are real values. And if they're positive, then they'll be in the time-like light cone. If they're negative, they'll be in the space-like light cone. And different people will be on different locations um, there. But it's just constant values, constant real values. Okay, so what if we rotate this by exactly 45 degrees? Hmm. Well, will that be a new zero? It's like, sure, that's when dt is zero or dr is zero. <clears throat> and now we have these hyperboles, and these are imaginaries. These are constant space times time. And that is my proposal for gravity. These are now non-inertial observers that agree about their space times time. So what if all we wanted to do was to leave the space times time invariant between two observers, but be consistent with Newton's law of gravity? So we're going from flat space-time to one that's affected by Newton's law of gravity. And we put in this little square root term, and you go, why'd you do that? 
Why did I do that? Because when you square it, then you get this factor in front of the dt squared, which is a way of writing Newton's law. This is something that's known if you go study uh, general relativity, that that first term is the Newtonian term. And then in front of the dr, you have its inverse. So that when you form the space times time term, it looks exactly the same. And one realization I should have had a long time ago <laughs> was that that uh, original term in front of um, the DT thing is the relativistic way of writing the Newtonian escape velocity. In other words, Newton himself derived the Newtonian escape velocity and we've just written it in the a relativistic form where it's actually a dimensionless uh, fraction of the speed of light. So that's kind of a nice thing, you know, tying it back to, to the old man himself. All right, and now this was the final uh, sort of thing saying, well, what, if, what about uh, weak field tests of general relativity? What would it take to get there? And what would it take is just one more term and add it on here. And the nice thing about this is that this is consistent with all weak field tests of gravity so far. So we're going to get with be consistent with light bending around the sun, radar reflections off of um, Mercury, and uh, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, because we've got exactly the same five terms that go into what's called the parameter parameterized post-Newtonian uh, way of writing uh, um, writing things. So that means we're going to be consistent with a whole bunch of experiments. And at the end of this, he said, uh, this person I was had my Skype conversation, he didn't see anything wrong with it. What he recommended was there's this preprint server, um, ARXIV. And they have a very low bar of acceptance, and that is that you have to be associated with uh, a real research institution. I, I, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> I am a fringe physicist. I'm not in denial of this. And he said, instead, just print, uh, just send a paper to the reverse of this. Uh, <laughs> it's it's V-I-X-R-A. And I went and looked at a few of the papers on gravity in that, uh, that service that is just open source. Absolutely anybody can um, send their papers to there. And quite frankly, it was like embarrassing. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of like bad writing and really nonsense. I, in other words, I can't believe uh, Sabine or this person I talked to ever go there to read um, what has been posted. Now, they probably go with some regularity to the real preprint server and try and they, they, they definitely go there to um, keep up with what's going on and they never go to this open source one because the open source one is just full of, it's a dumpster fire. It's just a bunch of crap. And so that was kind of um, disappointing uh, that that was uh, a recommendation. Now, I'm trying to come to a peace uh, with it, uh, say, well, look, if I'm easy to dis dismiss, okay, I can't get around that. Uh, I thought if I brought something up to, that this guy didn't know what it did in all of physics and it was really simple, space times time, that should like ring a, a really loud bell. It didn't. That's just the observation. I mean, posting to this open source preprint server probably isn't going to work. But of course, this 50 bucks didn't work either. So. 
<laughs> so uh, rock meet hard place. Um, but was it worth it? Of course it was. Uh, I got these. I got this little video out of it. Uh, I can see the escape velocity Newton wrote down oh so long ago, uh, right in my proposal where it, it's got to live. And so that looks kind of reasonable to me. And he concluded that he couldn't see a, an obvious flaw, not that there isn't a flaw or there aren't shortcomings to it. And I still feel that way. And that that is worth the time and the money. All right. Thank you very much.